you know, over idea of some of the background related to that. So chapter one then actually begins our study of Vajrayogini. And so chapter one looks at Vajrayogini and the Buddhist tantras. How does all of this fit together? What is the place of Vajrayogini in the, the pantheon of various tantras, in Buddhist tantras specifically? Well, Vajrayogini flourished, as we mentioned, between the 10th and 12th centuries in India. And this is about the same time as the second dissemination of Buddhism into Tibet and the founding of the major schools, except for the Nyingma, which means old school. So there wasn't a school, per se, previous to the second dissemination, but they needed to call it something, so they called it the old school, the Nyingma school. And so then there were those four major schools. There's another, in addition to the Bon, there's also a school that has emerged somewhat recently uh, that was kind of hidden away and almost destroyed earlier uh, called the Jonak. And uh, that one has also been recognized as a significant school by the Dalai Lama. How do you spell that? Jonang, uh, kind of the way it sounds, J-O-N-A-N-G. And so the dissemination into Tibet is what, because Buddhism in India, uh, as a result of the Muslim invasions that happened toward the end of that period of time, basically was destroyed. And Hinduism survived, and the Muslim tradition survived during that time. Uh, but Buddhism pretty much went away. And it uh, disseminated up into Tibet. Many of the people basically escaped from India and went up into Tibet as a part of that. And so they continued the tradition in Tibet up even until today and now with the reverse dissemination from Tibet back into India, Nepal, and, and other locations, uh, it's still continuing. One of the things that we sometimes talk about in terms of looking at various texts is the Tibetan canon. Uh, various branches of Buddhism have organized texts into what they consider to be the canon of the, the formal documents that they recognize and accept as the key documents of the tradition. And in the Tibetan canon there are about 500 tantric scriptures. That's a lot. <laughs> So it's a big part of the tradition. And in addition to that, there are over 3,000 commentaries on those texts. So it's a huge collection of things. Now some of them are fairly short, but it's still a huge collection. And this is, these are all forms of Tantra, not just Vajrayogini. In the late 7th century CE, there was more emphasis on traditional Buddhist principles and values that were beginning to be placed on Tantra. And so things begin to change a little bit. And if you know very much about the history of this period of time and some of the things that were going on, uh, as I mentioned before, Tantra may have started as early as the first century. Uh, we certainly know texts began to appear by uh, the late 6th century, so late 500s, um, some of the earliest texts, maybe even the, begin the middle of that period of time. But one of the things that we know is that the way Tantra was described began to change. And it became what I like to refer to as monasticized. Okay, so when we talk about Tantra the way it's described in the very early period, it has a quality about it that seems to be related to the 60s in our country, <laughs> where we have people going out in the woods and drinking alcohol and having free sex and all of these kinds of things. But this actually continued to some degree uh, with the yogis. Uh, they continued to treat it as a more literal interpretation, if you will, of Tantra. But how do you deal with monks who take vows of celibacy? Uh, 
Okay? And so that became somewhat problematic, and this was a really popular movement. It uh, seems to have originated outside of any of the other specific religious traditions, although several of them claim it started with theirs. Uh, but scholars tend to, although not all, tend to disagree that that is probably where it originated. Uh, but it was formed, and so the Hindus adapted a certain version, the Shaivas adapted a certain vision, version, and the Buddhists adapted versions as well. But when you've got celibacy as one of the key tenets of being a monastic, then you have to figure out how to make this work. And the way that that became solved, and there's variations within the different lineages and so forth, was that uh, we made it symbolic, okay? So all of this was done in a very symbolic manner. Or in a few cases, it could also be done with a slight reinterpretation of what we mean by celibacy. So we tend to think of celibacy as not having sexual intercourse. Uh, but it became interpreted in some cases as long as the male did not ejaculate, so there was no semen, then it's still a form of celibacy. Okay? So we get those different interpretations that happen here as a part of that. But for the most part, we could say that it became highly symbolic in nature. But some of the yogis still continued to practice it with an actual consort rather than a wisdom consort or imagined consort, if you will. So Tantra is actually a branch of Mahayana in the broader perspective. I usually refer to Mahayana as the path of altruism because the focus tends to be on how do we help other beings achieve enlightenment rather than just focusing on ourselves. Uh, and in that, there's various definitions of what Tantra is. Uh, one of the ways it's defined as kind of a weaving together, or you might describe it as an integration of different things. Um, there are various sources, rituals, and texts that uh, try to describe it or define it and so forth. And it's not clear. We have this kind of a vague background in terms of where it came from and the word Tantra somewhere in that process literally disappeared. And so it's being reinterpreted going backwards as to what the intent of that specific meaning was as a part of that. Uh, but it does have this quality of kind of integrating and bringing things together. So we're bringing together a more religious tradition with a more um, human tradition, <laughs> I say, in terms of uh, our, our actual uh, practices of, of integrating everyday kinds of things into a more spiritual kind of an environment and finding ways to, to do that. Uh, another characteristic that we began to see as a part of this is in the very earliest forms of deity yoga, which begin to show up in the early Mahayana or later Mahayana, would be a better way to say it, traditions, um, we do see uh, Vajrapani, Chinrezi, Tara, a few of those deities begin to show up in the Mahayana before Tantra. <clears throat> With the emergence of Tantra, we begin to see a change in the nature of the deities. And the primary change that we see is that they begin to take on a wrathful form. So if you look around at the Tankas over here, you'll see, for example, here we have the 21 Taras and a white Tara and so forth, and the very peaceful forms. They tend to have clothing that looks very much like royalty would wear. They have crowns and gold jewelry and fine silks and so forth. And their form is usually seated and a very peaceful look about them and so forth. And so we tend to call those the peaceful deities. And when we get to Tantra, then we have these wrathful forms. And so when we look at those, we see something very different. Uh, first of all, they tend not to be wearing gold and silks and so forth, but they tend to be wearing things made out of pieces of bone. And they may be wearing skins of wild animals. 
and they may be standing up in these kind of wrathful forms with large fangs for teeth and and uh, they may have extra eyes like in the forehead or in uh, other places and so forth although we have white tar over here that has some of those features as well in terms of eyes but we find a very different kind of uh, form that they are taking as a part of this as we grow into Tantra. Uh, there's also a push in the development that went on pretty much simultaneously with this. Well, a couple of things. One was we began to see a more uh, dominant emphasis of the feminine. And this actually started fairly early in the process, uh, beginning of the first century, and probably the first century prior to that, um, began to see some of that. And you see it in lots of different forms. The, the images began to, to change. And so figures that were maybe just local spirits became to be more general. They began to be elevated. They became goddesses instead of just spirits. Um, and they began to become deities in the Buddhist tradition. And so we see that the divine feminine aspect began to take on more strength. Along with that, we see some changes in culture uh, where the Vedas were very, very strict. Lots and lots of rules about what you could and could not do and who could do it. Uh, particularly in terms of the spiritual aspect of things. You had to go to the Brahmins, which were the highest of the classes, and get them to do things for you, and you paid them or gave them things that you had in order for them to do that for you, or they wouldn't do it. Uh, things like that. And so uh, we, we go through this period of change where people were becoming dissatisfied with those kind of changes. We also have a change in culture because of an increase in trade and people becoming business people and uh, that began to have some influence because they had more money. They could use that money to buy different kinds of things and not just products but services in terms of spiritual kinds of things. Uh, the women had more independence and so forth and so somewhere in there we had the beginnings of this tantric thing. Now I mentioned that this has various sources uh, one of the theories was that this was some kind of an indigenous movement. Don't know when it started. Some people trace it clear back to some of the various earliest of the uh, female-oriented kinds of things that happened in history uh, related to uh, fertility rights and so forth that go back to kind of prehistory, if you will. Uh, there's not a lot of good evidence for that that relates to Tantra specifically, however. But there could, still could have been this element of that um, related to some kind of an indigenous kind of development. A, another kind of the uh, process that happened was that this began to, uh, or another possibility, let's say, uh, is that this was something that was developed very intentionally as a spiritual type practice, religious type practice, and that from the very beginning it was all symbolic. And the symbolism was to hide the real meaning of that. It was very secret. My problem with that from a scholarly point of view is why do you want to hide the, the kind of material that is all about spiritual or religion and couch it in the context of sex. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. It makes a whole lot more sense to me to do exactly the opposite of that, whereas you want to hide the sex ritual aspect of it and couch it in terms of religious terminology. Okay? So I have a little trouble with the, the inverse of that, although that's still one of the, the models out there. Um, and there are some good uh, studies that are done based on textual analysis, and I mentioned we're getting much better at doing that. And there's some that do support at least that in, in some ways. Another one that I read a book about that I thought was particularly interesting that might be another possibility uh, 
is that in the Taoist tradition in China, uh, there is a sexual practice in which men do not ejaculate in order to preserve the male energies, and but the female can, and they can give their energies away to the male, but the male can't give it back, heaven forbid. And so, uh, but the idea of non-emission as a part of a sexual practice could have been a source for the start of that in Tantra. Now, whether it was merging together with something else or not, it's hard to say. Uh, but it does make sense because there were people from China that came and visited in uh, northern India. And so we can see other kinds of connections. There were some of those that came a little bit later on that attested to the development of this and the popularity of this and so forth. Uh, there is a little bit of information. I have to be a little bit speculative in terms of people who came even earlier that, that might have brought that Taoistic kind of an approach into the tradition some way. But the bottom line is we really don't know. Okay? So we just have to kind of accept it as it is and so forth. Uh, but part of that was that we had this development early on and we began to see the uh, convergence of these different things, but at particularly around 600, we began to see more of the development of this monastic approach, symbolic approach to all of this. Now, if you have your book with you, and you go to pages 12 and 13, there's a graph here that shows some of the development of different history. The top row is some of the different rulers uh, in different places. That doesn't really give us very much information. There are then some different events as a part of that. The foundation of Nalanda, for example. Um, then a uh, really small print here. Uh, Vikramashila was founded, another great university. Uh, the first diffusion into Tibet in the 700s, although it's, I would put that a little bit later than where it is there. Um, it's in the general area, let's say. Uh, the second diffusion into Tibet, again, it's, it's, it's probably okay, but it goes along a lot further than that would indicate. Uh, Nalanda being sacked in 1197. Uh, Vikramashila was sacked in 1203. Those were two of the great universities at the time. So that gives you a general overview of the time frame. And then it's got various authors listed in this big block here of uh, some of those. Um, you can see uh, most of those, well, we have the top, we have Indrabhuti, uh, which is a little bit controversial because it appears now, as best we can tell, that there were three different figures that had that same name. And trying to sort out who was responsible for what has become a bit of a challenge, although people are still working on that. Uh, also shows Naropa, Atisha, we uh, uh, didn't mention Atisha, but uh, he went into Tibet uh, around uh, 1000, a little before, a little after uh, that time, and, and then eventually died in Tibet. Um, going on down through the list, uh, starting on page 12, we have Naropa, who was one of the Mahasiddhas of India, uh, Lakshmi Kara, uh, and then we have another Virupa, so there was a question again about Virupa and where he lived, and then we have another Lakshmi Kara, <laughs> and then we have another Virupa, I mean, <laughs> so some questions here about, you notice they have question marks around them about the exact timing of these, or were there different people with different, the same name, like in Djibouti, what we mentioned before, and so forth. So there are some difficulties in trying to figure out some of these very early people and who was where and did what at what time and so forth. But the last grouping here is, I think, the most useful to us in terms of what we're talking about, which are some of the various works. And so on the top line there, we have the Kriya Tantras. These are outer Tantras. These are some of the various early forms of Tantras that we found, where we basically visualize usually a peaceful deity, like we mentioned before, 
They tend to be visualized outside of our own body, hence the term outer tantras. The yoga tantras right after that also tend to be an outer tantra form as a part of that, but can involve the outer, ta outer guru or deity merging into and with us. The Karya Tantras that is just down below that was kind of the second phase of the Outer Tantras. Then the Yoga Tantras was kind of the third phase of Outer Tantras. We can see all of those happening there in what's depicted as the uh, early 600s. So that's pretty close to what I was saying, but they've got an arrow moving into that first one of the Kriya Tantras. So that kind of indicates that some of that came from a little bit earlier, as I was mentioning. And then we have the Yoga Tantras developing. The Yoga Tantras were starting to get into the completion uh, or the wrathful forms of Tantras, if you will. And, and then we have the Yogini Tantras, which she points out for a while at least was, became a separate, separate class of Tantras, independent from the Yogatara Tantras. And then that goes on then, and you'll see down below that on page 13, below the Yogini Tantras, we have Chakra Samvara Tantra that I mentioned, and Havajra Tantra, another one of the major Tantras in the Tibetan tradition, and Kala Chakra Tantra, which was probably the last of the major Tantras, not probably, it was the last of the major Tantras that was developed in Tibetan Buddhism. And so then we go over to the end of this section here, and we have the compilation of the Guya Samaja uh, Dhanamala and uh, Sadamala. So this is somewhere in there. Notice the arrow just points in, in that direction. So it doesn't say exactly where, but as she was pointing out in the text part of this, somewhere between the, around the 11th, 12th centuries. It was developed as a part of that. And then she points out also there was a palm leaf manuscript of that that was written down sometime after that. Part of the problem with texts that were written in India is that they were often written on palm leaves. Palm leaves in a humid environment don't survive very well. And so we don't have very many of these original sources. Uh, the sources that we have tend to be just a few hundred years old. And so the oldest things that we have uh, just are not, there are just very few of them. There were a few, for example, that were written down on birch bark or some kind of bark, uh, a couple of different forms of bark that have survived. They appear to have been written back, written, they've been dated to around 1,000 or no, go back around to the first century, so that would be around 100, not 1,000. Um, so there are a few little pieces that are fairly old. There are a few more in the mid uh, three to 500 range that there are. There was even one set of palm leaves that were apparently preserved inside of something that, that helped keep it from being destroyed. But there are just very few of these. Some of them are in the, the British Museum and a few other museums around the world. Uh, but there just aren't very many of those until what we would say is actually fairly recently. So we have to rely on those for part of that. So that graph, I think, gives us a little bit of a visual depiction of the time frame and how these things uh, fit in together with each other. So Buddhist Tantra and Vajrayogini. So Tantra, as I mentioned, is a branch of the Mahayana. We looked at some of the different forms of this. We talked about the wrathful uh, form of this, some of the changes that happened in the elevation, particularly of some of the feminine. But it wasn't just the feminine. It also was the masculine of being elevated from the level of a spirit to a, to a god or goddess to a deity, a Buddha. And one of the problems we sometimes have with language and translation is that in English, we don't have really good words that match up real well with Sanskrit. And so when we talk about a god versus a deity, in English they're virtual synonyms. But we needed two different words to differentiate between the two, and so 
it has become a custom, if you will, although sometimes causing difficulty for people understanding, to use those two words, God and deity, in different ways in the Buddhist tradition. So a god refers to a particular form of a being. Uh, so if we talk about the Hindu gods, for example, which the Buddha did because the, those, well, in his case, it would have been Vedic gods, if you will, as well as some of the other religious traditions of the time. But there were a fair number of gods by then, and early Upanishads had been written by then. And so we have some of those kind of things. So that's the gods. But the gods are not Buddhas. Okay? And so we needed another word to refer to Buddhas. And so translators began to use the word deity to refer to something that was not a god, but better than a god, if you will, in a form of a Buddha. And so we have those two words. And just like to point out the, the difficulty sometimes involved in our understanding uh, the words that are used in English in the translations. Um, I also mentioned this growing influence of the yogini, of the female, as a part of this, an enlightened female, has an actual bona fide deity in and of itself, uh, which began with Tara but eventually evolved. And so we had the Chakrasambara, where Vajra yogini is just a consort. But then she moves on, is elevated to the level of a deity uh, on her own. And one of the interesting things that happened was that in the beginning, when roles began to get reversed, and so you have a female deity with a male consort. Now before I talked about the wrathful forms, and so we had a deity and a consort, I didn't mention gender. But this is a patriarchal society. And so, not surprisingly, the deities tended, not always, but tended to be male, and the consorts then tended to be female, but not always. And as a part of this development, some of those roles got reversed. Now, you'll be a little bit hard-pressed to find depictions, pictures and so forth, showing the female as the deity and the male as the consort, but there are some. Uh, I've seen three or four of those, not very many, but there are some that show them in, in that manner. And in addition to that, another phenomenon developed in the depiction of the female deity. The males just disappeared. Okay, So you look at the tanka over here, you notice there are no males in the picture. Okay. And usually, oftentimes, we have all of these surrounding other figures, almost always male figures, although sometimes we have other dakinis that are depicted, the female forms. Uh, but it began, they began to disappear from the various depictions of the, the female deities as a part of that, and especially the consorts. The male consorts began to disappear. But a symbol was added. And the symbol was the staff that you oftentimes see, the katvanga. And the katvanga becomes the symbol of having a male consort, or female. I mean, you see a picture of uh, Padmasambhava often has a kat, holding a katvanga, indicating that he also is not celibate. So it's not exclusive to females. But when you have a female figure by themselves, they very often have a katvanga showing that they are not celibate, that they are, in fact, uh, uh, open to a relationship or practice involving a male. Uh, Vajravarahi and Vajra Yogini also uh, were, in the way that they were developed, uh, were modeled after Chakrasambhara and Vajrayogini as his consort. So a lot of the language and the way that, that uh, she shows up in the practice of the Tantra and the commentaries and so forth, a lot of that was borrowed in the process of developing the model for Vajrayogini originally and then Vajravarahi and she was developed after that. Uh, but the male figures were left out. Okay, So they, they used the material, but they modified it and changed it so that the male figures were generally, generally left out as a part of that. But they borrow very freely, especially from the commentaries. And 
uh, picking up material that they can use to articulate what Vajrayogini, who Vajrayogini is, what she does, and all those kind of things. Um, she talks also a little bit in the text at this point about various classifications. I mentioned that a couple of times of texts, um, but I'm not going to go through that. If you want to read that part, you can. Uh, it's a little bit sometimes like trying to put a round peg in a square hole because these things just don't match up real well. And the texts were developed independent of classifications, and so you know, it's hard to make those connections in, in some cases. It's an interesting thing if you're interested in that kind of thing. But if you're not, then it's uh, not too interesting. So um, the other thing then that she begins to talk about at this point is this collection of texts, this Guya Samaja Sadnamala. And so these are the most direct sources for Vajrayogini, the most direct sources of texts for Vajrayogini. There's a collection, as I said, of 46 sadhanas, but they are difficult to date, although she does make some attempts at doing this, and she gives some rationale for how to do that. But as we pointed out, giving dates can be a fairly difficult thing to do. But in the book, she goes through and, and makes several attempts based on some associations that are uh, given in some of these of what dates they might have been around. Uh, then she spent some time talking a little bit about the, the milieu of Tantra. Uh, Tantra usually articulates these practices as being done uh, in the mountains, in a cave, and those kinds of things. But they begin to become articulated more as, uh, well, how do you do this in a monastery? <laughs> okay. Well, you have to change the nature of the text. And so that's part of what happened. I mentioned it in terms of, kind of the understanding of it from a monastic point of view. But it also makes it possible to do the, the actual practices in a monastery uh, where you don't have, I mean, they were divided. The male monasteries and the female monasteries were very divided from each other. Um, and so the uh, prescriptions, if you will, for doing these practices, as I said, typically were some kind of a wild, solitary place like the, the mountains and so forth, where charnel grounds were often used, which we would today call a cemetery, but our cemeteries look nothing like the charnel grounds there. That charnel grounds were a place where if you didn't have the money to cremate the body, you took the body and basically dumped it. There were wild animals that would come to eat the bodies and so forth. and. A few wild Dakinis are said to have lived in those places as well. So there are these mythical and legendary elements as a part of this. And uh, we began to go from monastery to tantric yogi. So the, as they did the practices, they would start in the monastery. They would go through their formal monastic training. But then they would take on, they would give up their vows, uh, monastic vows, and become a yogi and go out and do these practices in a more literal way as a yogi. Uh, in fact, it became something of a, a, a goal, an ideal, to be kicked out of the monastery. <laughs> well, I was kicked out of the monastery, so that's, that's how I can do these practices. Um, it may actually transcend ritual and mantras and so forth. In the beginning, of course, ritual and uh, citing of mantras and so forth is very important. Uh, and uh, it still involves others, though, as she points out, others performing some of the rituals. So the monastics that stayed in the monastery would still perform the rituals to benefit those who went out as yogis to actually do these practices. So there was still a monastic connection that was being made as a part of this. It wasn't just people going out and saying, I quit, I'm going to go do these other practices. And then we have, uh, oh, it was also open to householders. Um, this was a practice that could be done by householders. It doesn't appear that this was something that was uh, emphasized a great deal, uh, but it was certainly there and well documented. 
Um, but that also seemed to create a little bit of tension between householders and monastics. Okay, oh, you guys can do this practice, but we can't do this practice. Da 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 da. Um, so it created some uh, degree of, of difficulty, tension, if you will, between them. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that it recommended was a solitary location for doing these sexual practices. And so I already talked about the issues of celibacy and the reinterpretation of celibacy in terms of semen not being ejaculated. And so that became a way of allowing some monastics, usually it's described as those who had become very highly realized monastics were allowed to do these practices. And nobody else would be able to do them. Uh, Atisha, for example, who, as I mentioned, went from Tibet or from India into Tibet and became the founder of the Kadampa order, which later became reinterpreted by Jaitsangkapa and became the Galupa order. Uh, talked about it as a symbolic, in a symbolic way. It was a symbolic tech, um, interpretation. Others say he would not even permit taking the secret and wisdom uh, in, uh, empowerments. Uh, the traditional in, in uh, the um, tantric tradition, there are four basic empowerments. Sometimes there's more than this, but there's a, a generic four empowerments that are given as a part of highest yoga tantra. And so those four are the vase empowerment, secret wisdom, and word empowerments. Um, the early versions of the secret and wisdom empowerments involved actual sex acts as a part of that between the lama or the, whoever the, the vajra master was and a consort. And the emission of the uh, semen as a part of that and tasting the semen and so forth. That was all part of that very early ritual as a part of that. Atisha's, Atisha said, no way. <laughs> you can't even take those vows, even if it's all symbolic. Okay, That's not appropriate and you're not going to do it. You've got vows of celibacy, so no, don't do those things. Um, so. That was one, actually Atisha, or not Atisha, Jason Kappa had something, not exactly the same, but uh, he said, yeah, you can't do this, but only the highest level people can do it. And you really only need to do this once to get the effect. And he himself is said to have not done it and to opted to wait until he died to achieve realization uh, rather than go through this particular practice. Because some of them were saying you can't achieve enlightenment in this lifetime unless you actually have a consort do a, a consort practice. So he said, "Okay, I'll accept that, but only one time." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to do it that way. I'll wait instead of doing it in this lifetime. So it's it's a little hard to know. Documentation, as I said, isn't really good. There are bits and pieces and more and more continues to come out about some of these things. And it may not have been so different in the actual practice. Some of the, the uh, monks, the, the difference here being talked about was having to do with the, the monasteries versus going out into the forests and the, the private places and so forth. Because the monastics actually did an, a number of those kinds of things. They wandered about. They wandered from monastery to monastery, from teacher at one place to a teacher someplace else. And they went out and they did retreats in the woods and so forth and caves. And so they actually were doing a bunch of these things that the yogis were also doing as a part of that. So there's not as much of a difference. Um, they didn't do it as much as the yogis because they were doing it pretty much all the time. Uh, but there are, are some differences but not complete differences between those two. 